Apex Express, Asian Pacific Expression. Community and cultural coverage. Music and calendar. New visions and voices. Coming to you with an Asian Pacific Islander point of view. It's time to get on board the Apex Express. Greetings, folks. Welcome to Apex Express News and Views with an API point of view. On tonight's show, we broadcast a small collection of speakers from the Moana Nui event that took place on May 31st to June 2nd in Berkeley. The event brought together close to 50 speakers with over 20 nations represented from Asia, Hawaii, and Oceania. You ready to roll with me on this one? I'm your host, RJ Lozada. Stay with us. a lot to share with you this evening, but first, we begin our weekly global API news roundup on Apex Express, headlines from around the globe, by Marie Che. This is Marie Che with this week's Apex Update. This weekend, hundreds of Hong Kong residents rallied behind National Security Agency whistleblower Edward Snowden. They demanded an end to the NSA's mass surveillance programs and called on the Hong Kong government to protect him. Here's one of the protesters, Billy Lung. Having the U.S. government, any government, to monitor on my activities on the Internet is, is a matter of great concern to me. Uh, I think it would be very important for Hong Kong to uh, be able to safeguard that right to decide um, in terms of its extradition if, if, if there's such a request being put to us. Hong Kong Legislative Counselor for Information Technology Charles Mock declared his support for Snowden in an interview with Amy Goodman on Democracy Now! He got to get his due process, all the rights that he is accorded according to Hong Kong laws. I think uh, the, the, the Morning Post just did a survey over the weekend of uh, a number of people in Hong Kong and uh, actually more than half uh, do believe that he should be uh, protected uh, by our Hong Kong law as much as possible uh, according to our system and all the due process that he should be getting. Meanwhile, Snowden is continuing to release information about the National Security Agency's surveillance programs. This week, he shared information with the South China Morning Post about the U.S. government's mass surveillance in China and Hong Kong. He also released documents to The Guardian, documenting the joint program between the U.S. and British governments to spy on delegates at the G20 summit meetings in 2009 in London. They monitored delegates' phone calls and set up internet cafes where they could access delegates' emails. There's no word yet of any official U.S. extradition attempts, although there have been reports that U.S. lawyers are building a legal case against Snowden, both in the United States and Hong Kong. Civil rights groups in New York City filed a lawsuit Tuesday against the New York Police Department for a profiling and surveillance program targeting Muslims. The organizations say that the NYPD's Muslim surveillance program is unconstitutional and prevents people from freely practicing their religion. One of the plaintiffs in the lawsuit, Imam Hamid Hassan Raza, spoke out about the impact of the NYPD spying program at a press conference this week. Because of our knowledge and fear that the NYPD is spying on us, I have for years taped the sermons I give because I'm afraid an NYPD officer or an informant will misquote me or take a portion of a sermon out of context. Because of NYPD spying, I'm not able to fulfill my duty as an imam. I'm constantly falling short of my obligations to my congregation. By not discussing important topics, our mosque should be an open religious and spiritual sanctuary. But NYPD spying has turned it into a place of suspicion and censorship. 
A report released earlier this year by the Muslim American Civil Liberties Coalition, the Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund, and the City University of New York's Creating Law Enforcement Accountability and Responsibility Project documented this program. The NYPD has been targeting Muslims throughout the northeastern part of the United States since 2002. The program monitored Muslims at their places of worship and social spaces like local cafes, Muslim student organizations, and community cricket matches. According to these organizations, the NYPD surveillance program created a climate of fear and suspicion among Muslims, but has not yielded any results. In a speech yesterday, Cambodian Prime Minister Hun San warned garment workers that their protests for higher wages could drive big manufacturers out of the country. This comes just one week after 300 workers were fired for continuing to strike the Sabrina Garment Factory, which manufactures sportswear for Nike. The 300 workers are part of the Free Trade Union of Cambodia and stayed out on strike even after their counterparts, who are members of the Cambodian Garment Workers Union, went back to work. On the same day as the Prime Minister's announcement, 3,000 garment workers blocked part of National Highway 2 in Phnom Penh. They had been on strike for two weeks. Their demands include allowances for food, transportation, and living expenses, and assurances that factory management won't fire pregnant workers. After blocking the highway for over two hours, factory management agreed to negotiate with the H&M workers. According to the Garment Manufacturers Association of Cambodia, strikes by Cambodian garment workers quadrupled last year. Lawmakers in India are still considering a food security bill, which the United Progressive Alliance says will provide government-subsidized grain to 67% of India's population. If passed, low-income families would receive 5 kilograms of grain each month. They may also receive food coupons, similar to food stamps in the United States. The major political parties have not been able to reach agreement on the bill. Critics say that the bill will cost the government too much money and create another avenue for corruption. People across Indonesia hit the streets Monday to protest a 44% hike in subsidized gas prices. Working class Indonesians are concerned that increasing gas prices will automatically increase the costs of just about everything, including food, clothing, and transportation. The government deployed thousands of police officers who battled with protesters late into the night. In an interview with NDTV, Nurdin Muhyiddin explained his reasons for joining the protests. If Parliament approves the government proposal, our purchasing power would decrease, and employers would cut wages, and medium-scale industries would disappear. Fuel prices would trigger rising prices, especially for basic commodities. This is Indonesia's second attempt to substantially raise gas prices. The last attempt in March of 2012 failed when lawmakers backed out at the last minute, fearing repercussions from their constituents. This time around, they did pass the gas price hike. After high-level talks between North and South Korea were called off last week, the DPRK called for direct talks with the United States. We propose high-level talks between the North Korean and the U.S. government to ease tensions on the Korean Peninsula and establish regional peace and security. South Korean President Park Geun-hye called President Obama shortly after the offer was made, encouraging him to decline talks. Here's U.S. State Department spokeswoman Jen Psaki. And North Korea must engage in authentic and credible negotiations uh, that produce concrete denuclearization actions. So uh, is it different than that? Uh, no, we haven't seen evidence of that. Um, and that is, uh, that is what we're waiting for. Although North Korea has not yet responded, the U.S. demand to end North Korea's nuclear program has historically been a non-starter. The DPRK has, however, expressed willingness to rejoin the six-party talks on the country's nuclear program. The six parties involved include China, South Korea, Japan, Russia, and the United States. Thank you again to Marie Che for that update. Wananui is Polynesian for Great Ocean and was the title of the three-day event, which was made up of marathon sessions of back-to-back panels covering nuanced conversations on globalization. The gathering of over 40 speakers covering all parts of the Pacific Ocean was timely, urgent. 
Moana Nui is a response to the momentum gathering on non-transparent trade deals like the Trans-Pacific Partnership, as well as the relo- reallocation of U.S. military bases and missions towards Asia, Hawaii, and Oceania. These movements by a weakening hegemon are gathering steam and demanded the minds of this forum to come together to talk shop, talk story, talk new ways of building their power base. The panels were made up of a hard-working cadre of who's who in civil society organizing, academics, and storytellers. As I've said, it was a marathon, but let's start you off on a good pace with three speakers. Let's start with John Osorio, professor of Hawaiian studies at the University of Hawaii, Manoa. John opens the teaching with a prayer, a musical dedication, and follows with this response to the question, why are you here? You know, why are we here? The, the, the descendants of those people who lived over thousands of years and handed knowledge down and obligations. What are those obligations? What do we bring to this conference as indigenous peoples? And then the sort of broader question for all of us, um, why are we here, uh, born into this time and in, into this strange and contorted civilization. Um, I think about all of these things because over the past few years, and, and really ever since Arnie cornered me into participating in Moana Nui 1, and, and, and believe me, that's something, I, you know, he still has a lot to answer for. <laughs> um, ever, ever since that moment, a number of us were drawn out of what were, at, at, to that point, very local struggles in Hawaii to deal with political issues and matters having to do with things like the su- survival of Hawaiian culture, of history, of language, Hawaiian sovereignty and governance, and, and brought face-to-face with issues that seemed to be extremely important on one hand and almost too difficult to completely understand on the other. Globalization, the creation of, 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 uh, trade packs and secret trade packs between countries and large businesses when we still haven't gotten our own people to understand the very basic elements of colonization. How it's worked since the 18th, 19th, and 20th centuries. And now we have to deal with a whole other range of difficulties that our own governments cannot deal with. I just wanted to sort of lay that out to you. <laughs> when we held Moana Nui in 2011, these intentions, I think, were fairly straightforward. APEC was coming to Honolulu, and it seemed an appropriate time to focus public attention on Hawaii, Asia, and Oceania with a different lens than was likely to be used by politicians, corporate representatives, and sadly, the press. That conference, and this one, reveals all of the contradictions of hope and realistic expectations that seem to characterize all of us here who participate in this broad movement to bring a saner, less consumptive, and destructive society into existence. That this movement of ours is fired by people who live in communities racked by poverty environmental injustices, military occupation, and misuse, inadequate health care, ruinous diets, um, and almost negligent educational opportunities in all of the speakers, people who have been laboring uh, in communities that have to deal with these issues all of the time. And and it's, it's us, in large part, who have brought this larger movement to bear this larger movement to create saner, less consumptive, and destructive societies. It's not surprising to me who does this work today. On on one hand, you know, people who are really, really comfortable in the world generally have less reason to change the status quo. And, but that's only a part of the story. Because Clearly, there are people here who could lead even more comfortable lives. I tend to think that for many of us, those of us who live closer to and beneath the poverty line are people who at some moment in our growing up 
chose not to pursue wealth as the principal occupation of our lives. And I see quite a few of those people here today. This is a large and broad movement that is largely conducted by people who the rest of the world consider helpless. Poor people, undereducated, unhealthy, striving to um, create some kind of access to reasonable resources in their own communities. What could pe such people possibly have to say to the broader issues of how the world is governed and how the world is used? And it turns out we have everything to say about it. We are here to proclaim our commitment to struggle. Let me use as an example of this commitment to struggle the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, passed by the General Assembly, only recently endorsed by the President of the United States, who the U.S. originally opposed the Declaration. Um, here is an example of something... Look, decades of long work that proceeded from a near silence to a compelling volume of patriots, cultural practitioners, scholars, and laborers, people who came together to work on this declaration. Close friends devoted their lives to bringing birth to the, to the declaration, and in the process forsook their friendships as the politics of international work and the necessity of dealing with powerful self-interests drove people of principle apart from one another. When I attended the permanent forum uh, on indigenous issues at the UN this just a couple of weeks ago, um, those kinds of stories were everywhere in the air. Individuals were named people who broke off from other people, people who thought of others as sellouts, people who thought of others as being unreasonable, foolish, heard those stories over and over again. And I thought about um, how amazing a thing it is that this declaration, which although certainly imperfect, did absolutely provide a framework for native people to make claims and assertions, and per, perhaps even to improve, perhaps even to improve um, the quality of their lives and the access, their own access to their culture and their traditions. How amazing that such a thing should produce, in addition to that, such terrible political consequences. But we see for instance, um, that it continues. And any, any kind of improvement that we make, and this is why I say we are constantly having to recommit ourselves to struggle, any kind of improvement that we make will be taken and changed, altered, manipulated by people who have real power. Last year, the General Assembly of the UN decided to convene a high-level plenary of member nations to discuss the implementation of the, the, of the declaration, and this plenary will take place in September of 2014. They have invited very few indigenous peoples as delegates, but even the most experienced of our people believe that the conversations at that high-level plenary will be about us and not with us. What does one do when faced with a, an institution like the General Assembly and this declaration and the possibility of speaking to member states about how we can implement this declaration and make, um, make the survival of indigenous peoples in the world um, more of a guaranteed thing. Well, some of us and I think very sane and reasonable voices are saying that such things cannot be done from the top down in the first place. If the General Assembly is convening a high-level plenary, then the General Assembly will talk about what is important to states. If indigenous peoples want to make the declaration meaningful and matter, they must work from the ground up. 
I heard Maya yesterday say this. I've heard Santi Hitarandi, Hitarangi say the very same thing. You want to make the declaration work. It means going back to your communities. It means looking at the different ways in which do domestic and local laws are used against indigenous peoples and use the declaration um, as a way of countering them. Build law from the bottom up. Put more faith in the empowerment of the community to do this and worry less, I guess, about what's being done to you from the higher levels. We are here to celebrate real achievements. We are here to celebrate the inscription of French Polynesia on the list of non-self-governing territories. We believe that it will lead to real political movement and activism more activism in French Polynesia than, than we've seen before. We believe that at some point there will be, uh, they will have their moment of self-determination. Those are things worth celebrating. In Hawaii, we celebrate the fact that this year we were able to get the legislature to repeal a two-year-old law the Public Lands Development Corporation, a law that would have allowed, basically allowed a committee uh, to circumvent um, almost all of the state and county laws that have to do with land use. Uh, passed by the legislature, signed, actually not just signed by the governor, governor of the state wanted this badly. He accused those of us who opposed it with being hysterical, and hysterically we proceeded. Uh, <laughs> A lot of people participated in the movement to get this repeal. Many different organizations, and they showed up with their signs. And you know what, what the really wonderful thing about the PLDC was? It's not that we won this victory, because basically the state just turns around and figures out other ways to get what it wants. Phased in ag, um, architectural studies, um, those kinds of things. The state never runs out of opportunities to make things easier for development. What was good about the PLDC victory is that we brought a lot of people together. And because the victory showed people that you, you just basically have to do this work. We cannot abdicate to cynicism. We cannot abdicate to this notion that we are helpless, to this belief that, that states that companies, multinational companies, that money and capital are more powerful than the voice of people. We cannot surrender that basic point. And so when we celebrate, when we celebrate our achievements together, um, that's as important as the commitment we made to be in the struggle, to be in the first place. And finally, um, because I only have this minute, thank you. Uh, we are also here to recognize one another. Part of the celebration is to remember the struggles that were made by people, um, is to point out that, that some of our members have passed on and have gone to live with the ancestors. We need to remember their names. And, and I want to recognize uh, Soli Niheu, who passed away this past year, uh, an incredible warrior for uh, Kanaka Maoli. And I encourage all of you uh, in your own communities to remember those who have given, the, really, basically, basically surrendered their lives to this struggle and said, this is what I am going to do for the rest of my life. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter the, the, the cost to my body, to my health, to my frame of mind, because, because it's really hard to keep a hopeful aspect all of the time. Um, we need to remember these people. We need to celebrate them. We need to keep them foremost in our hearts. And so let me just finish by um, reiterating the Moana Nui Declaration that we composed together. A fairly large group of people who gathered in Honolulu uh, back in November of 2011. And if you haven't heard this before and if you haven't read this on our website, I will simply say, we the peoples of Moana Nui, connected by the currents of our ocean home, declare that we will not cooperate with the commodification of life and land as represented by apex predatory capitalistic practices, distorted information, and secret trade agreements, secret trade negotiations and agreements.
We invoke our rights to free, prior, and informed consent. We choose cooperative trans-Pacific dialogue, action, advocacy, and solidarity between and amongst the peoples of the Pacific, rooted in traditional cultural practices and wisdom. E mau ke e o ka aina i ka pono, a mama uano. Mahalo nui. Thank you. If you're just tuning in, you're listening to Apex Express on 94.1 FM or online at kpfa.org. You're listening to a small fraction of the brilliance presented at the Moana Nui conference that happened earlier this month in Berkeley. This event brought forth conversations on the Pacific Pivot, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, and Indigenous Rights, more compellingly known as sovereignty. Up next, Julian Aguan Chamorro son of Guam. Julian is a professor, attorney, and author. Julian holds up the question of sovereignty and sets it against the rule of law as expressed in the United Nations Resolution, Free, Prior, and Informed Consent. Small warning, Julian is quick. If you don't keep up with his tempo, you'll fall behind. I probably went through 20 versions of what I wanted to say to you today at this conference because although I am a lawyer, I often find myself um, encouraging everyone in the audience to have a very, very, very tuned and healthy disrespect for the law, only because I think that's very useful. So so I'm going to begin a little bit with um, the most... I mean, large, like from smallest to largest concentric circles. So I'm going to start with my own really personal background about the work that we do in Guam and then move out slightly to the wider Micronesian region where Guam is a part of the larger Micronesian region in the Western Pacific and then have a little bit of commentary about solidarity, impatience, and magic. So um, to start with Guam, Guam is one of 16 remaining UN-recognized colonies. Uh, the UN doesn't call us colonies. It prefers the term non-self-governing territories. So uh, we, we heard other panelists today talking about how French Polynesia was just re-inscribed on the list of non-self-governing territories. This is a list that the international community keeps because it recognizes that certain places, uh, mostly small island nations in the Pacific and Atlantic, um, are controlled mostly by the UK and the US. And these are territories whose inhabitants are colonized, um, are basically residents of islands that are colonies proper. So we remain on the list and we go back to the United Nations every single year. Uh, We're basically trapped because we don't really know how much value it is going to the UN every year to speak for four minutes and try to cram sort of 500 years of uninterrupted colonization in a four minute presentation. (laughs) But we remain a colony and we have a vivid, long-standing self-determination movement in Guam that's alive and well. Um, But I don't want to talk too much about self-determination in that context. I want to talk about the indigeneity context and actually explain why I was super confused before coming to this panel, um, this conference, about what panel I would be put on, either the militarism one or the indigeneity one, because both, truthfully, are inextricably tied when it comes to certain islands in the Pacific, because the indigenous rights movement in certain places are almost entirely about the throwing off of militarization, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, Although we know um, that there are so many important facets to the UN Declaration on the rights of indigenous peoples and this panel is entitled free prior and informed consent this is a so basically what the declaration so beautifully and masterfully does it launches the international community in a new direction sort of a direction based on a new set of values and the values um, are most crystallized in this free prior and informed consent provision that are peppered throughout the instrument but article 30 I want to just draw attention real quickly um, if I could read it to you military activity Activities shall not take place in the lands or territories of indigenous peoples unless justified by a, quote, relevant public interest or otherwise freely agreed with or requested by the indigenous peoples concerned. I want to explain why that language is so problematic to me because I am from a region where a single word can make a world of difference. The word strategic gives everybody in Micronesia a rash. We rush for Benadryl collectively (laughs) because we understand what the insertion of the one word means. In 
with the dawn of the United Nations in 1945, the world community and the nascent body did not know how to sort of deal with the colonies. So it came up with a bifurcate treatment. On the one hand, you have certain aspects of the UN Charter, certain chapters governing non-self-governing territories. And these were colonies of the victorious Western powers. So we were at first not entitled explicitly to independence, but only, quote, self-government. An ambiguous, purposely ambiguous term. Whereas the trust territories were colonies of the defeated Axis powers, and it was alone these territories that were allowed to evolve toward outright independence. But of the 11 trust territories established right after World War II, there was only one quote, strategic trust territory. And that is the tr strategic trust territory of the Pacific Islands, which comprises of now entities now known as the Republic of the Marshall Islands, the Republic of Palau, the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands, and the Federated States of Micronesia. So in this, the practical importance of the insertion of a single word, strategic, meant that the UN General Assembly, where at least in theory the lambs get to lay down with the lions, it was removed from GA overview. And it got kicked into, it was the only trust territory to be subjected to the oversight of the UN Security Council, just because of the insertion of the single word strategic. So when I see the declaration and I read so many awesome, very toothy provisions about free and prior informed consent, I, it's chilling that the free prior and informed consent provision did not in the end attach to the general prohibition on military activities because, precisely because, the people in small Pacific islands are being heavily militarized. So now I want to explain very quickly, give you a photograph of the kind of hyper-militarization. I would say it's a cataclysmic round of militarization that the people of Guam and the Northern Mariana Islands are sort of readying themselves for. Um, in Guam, in 2006, the U.S. agreed with the government of Japan to transfer some 8,000 U.S. Marines from Okinawa to Guam. So there's a transfer of 8,000 Marines in the beginning initially, but that number actually grew to 59,000. Not all Marines, but 59,000 U.S. military-related population that the U.S. intended, at least in its in draft environmental impact statement released in November 2009, the intent was to move 59,000 people, military-related population, to the island of Guam. Guam is a 30 mile long island and it's at, the, at its widest point it's eight miles wide and in this island the entire population is 180,000 so we are talking about a volatile demographic injection in a four to six year window of time of a population that eclipses the indigenous population so obviously that has many sort of portentous consequences for our still unexercised right of de decolonization and self-determination. So, so that's just one aspect. Um, there was also plans to birth the island's only deep draft water harbor what, for the accommodation of the, or the passage of nuclear aircraft carriers. So what this meant, practically speaking, was that they were going to destroy some 70 acres of healthy coral reef, rip coral reef out of the ocean floor to bring in nuclear aircraft carriers. And it's interesting, as a writer, I guess you latch on so naturally to the use of language because you see how often it's a very mischievous enterprise by, by the U.S. Department of Defense. So their, their idea in their document for mitigation for ripping 70 acres of coral reef out of the ocean floor was to plant some trees. I think Arundhati Roy said it so said it best when she said, what do you do with these levels of lunacy? What do you do when the doctors are the ones so dangerously deranged? So, I mean, for me, the, that kind of answer, it, it, it's sort of really illustrative of how the, the U.S. still views conceptually, politically, politically, economically, militarily, how it conceptualizes this entire region. Of course, it's sort of shape-shifting now. It's, it's now, it's not 8,000 Marines, it's 4,500 Marines, but next month it could be 20,000 Marines because they, it's sort of, it's constantly changing. And that's sort of another facet of the indigenous rights movement slash decolonization slash demilitarization movement on Guam. You have to, you know how they say you have to think on your
your feet. That is spectacularly true in Guam. You have to constantly figure out the precise um, strat your precise strategy of intervention. So on Guam, outside, I'll speak a little bit about the, the, the legal side just because that is my primary occupation right now. Uh, we filed a lawsuit against the U.S. Department of Defense under the National Environmental Policy Act, and we won. In effect, we were able to stall the, the proposed firing range in the word we're able to stall the proposed firing range over the ancient pocket village I was describing to you. But I also want to use this case study to show you just how limited the law is. The National Environmental Policy Act, and I erroneously used to call it the National Environmental Protection Act. You see the slip, right? <laughs> because I forgot what the P stood for. But clearly this statute has almost nothing to do with the protection of the environment. In fact, even if we want the lawsuit, we really didn't win much other than a tactical stall because the U.S.'s legal option is then to go back and submit a yet another supplemental environmental impact statement, which, by the way, no one can read. They came up with an 11,000-page document that the people of Guam were supposed to read in 45 days. I mean, it was like wading through the water of these 11,000 pages. It was so unreal. When I said the importance of the word strategic, there was something I want to describe for you on the ground what happened when the word strategic got inserted into before the words trust territory. Not only did it kick purview to the UN Security Council instead of the General Assembly, what it meant on the ground was the nuclear testing program. Between 1946 and 1958, the United States detonated 67 atomic weapons on the people of the Marshall Islands, all of those weapons falling on Bikini and Iwetak Atolls. I am a, I'm licensed in the Marshall Islands right now, and I'm trying to one of the, I guess, the most immediate tasks is to try to find a way to diversify our international legal innovations, our legal interventions and lawsuits. W with the Marshall Islands, it wasn't just that 67 atomic nuclear weapons were dropped. People were purposefully exposed and left on their islands. And then, f four, three years after the test, were actually brought back to the islands, even if the Atomic Energy Commission knew that the, it was irradiated to all hell. They were re returned, the people of Rangalap. And they, they lived there from 1957 to 1985 when Greenpeace on the Rainbow Warrior finally evacuated them. But the U.S. military said then there are only 90,000 people out there, Henry Kissinger famously said, who gives a damn? That's, that's basically the the plot has never changed. That's always been the attitude. So the people in the Marshall Islands were tr basically enrolled in a top secret military program known as F Project 4.1, where they were essentially studied and many of them not treated. They, the U.S. military wanted to study the effect of radiation poison uptake in human beings. So what we're trying to do, at least uh, what, I, what my, one of my roles is, to try to sort of uh, realize the limitations of international law and realize that genocide, for example, is a very specific intent crime. You actually have to prove they have the specific intent to, you know, commit genocide on you. And it's a very high bar. So we're trying to come up with strategies to either to charge instead of genocide, but charge crimes against humanity and figure out corporate defendants because the United States is going to hide behind sovereign immunity defenses. So this is just some of the work. But I, I think it's a good example as with the NEPA example on Guam is the limitations of law. I think it's really, really important. And I think people in the Pacific are becoming very clear that the law is the new gun. I mean, it's just what you hold up to people people's heads and say, don't move, don't eat that, don't, don't touch that. I mean, the law can be this incredible weapon, but it, it can actually be launched against people movements like a weapon of mass of destruction. The more important moves, although we should sort of be as fertile legal minds as we can be to try to get redress, realize that it's really limited. And the answer is with people struggles and it is with solidarity. The people of the Marshall Islands for all of the atrocities they suffered in terms of miscarriages, birth defects, birth abnormalities, like babies with two heads and no eyeballs and half of their internal organs on the outside of their bodies, they should should be in stand in solidarity and we should make global movements like that in Fallujah Iraq I mean the demo democracy now just had a huge program about the use of depleted uranium it, like leading to all of these um birth abnormality. So I, I envision for, as an example of the solidarity, and I, I would say that the Marshallese should get together with the people protesting the war on, on terror and make this sort of a, a really specific type of campaign. I, I foresee that happening. The last intervention I would say is that we 
even even us, we are suffering from so much trauma in the Micronesian region, Palau, the Marshall Islands, FSM. And you see that, I would say you don't have to look far. Just look at the voting patterns of the United Nations. There is no reason why the people of the Micronesian Islands should be opposing Palestinian bid for non-observer, um, non-member observer state status within the General Assembly, which good, it just happened. So that's another example of uh, solidarity that we could do. We could basically realize that we have no natural quarrel with Palestine. So this is something that else we can work on. Um, I'll, okay, done. Thank you. You are listening to Apex Express on 94.1 FM or online at kpfa.org. If you happen to be tuning in now, welcome. We're broadcasting speakers from the Moana Nui conference that happened earlier this month. And if you've been with us, I hope you've been able to keep up. Thanks for staying around. Up next is Annie Leonard, co-director of the Story of Stuff project. She sat on a panel about land and resource grabbing, corruption via collusion between government and corporations. Annie flips the script on the panel, and instead of talking about extraction, she talks about waste. One of the things that we export, which you may have heard about, is that we export hazardous pesticides. Our government allows companies to manufacture pesticides here that we deem are too dangerous to use here, that are banned, restricted, or never registered, and we are allowed to export them to other countries. That is a glaring double standard. We tend to hear more about this kind of export of hazard than others because a lot of the food comes back to us. So we're actually exposing ourselves. So we're actually consuming food with the banned pesticides, the pesticides that we have determined are too dangerous for us. So a lot of these pesticides are coming back. So we tend to hear more about that because we are at risk. Um, In addition to the risks from the ongoing export of pesticides, and it's extreme. The United States exports about 32 tons of pesticides an hour, like enormous amounts of pesticides. In addition to the ongoing exports, there's a problem with stockpiles of pesticides. Lots and lots of pesticides, millions and millions of tons of pesticides were exported from the U.S. and Europe to so-called developing countries or less industrialized countries um, over the last many decades, a lot over the 60s and 70s. Often the exporting company got development aid, and they they were often the wrong pesticide or they were mislabeled. It, the export was really meeting the exporting company's needs rather than the importing company's ne- country's needs. And so there are these stockpiles of pesticides all over the less industrialized world, including in Asia and the Pacific. The, they've been, some of them have been sitting there for 20, 30 years. The barrels are starting to leak. It is a huge problem. A global movement has developed that is calling for return to vendor. Send these back to the company who sent them. The problem is a lot of the labels have deteriorated, so we don't know. This is a real example where we need massive international collaboration and solidarity to clean up these toxic pesticide stockpiles. Often, um, manufacturing the pesticides here is even too toxic for us, so we export the whole entire industry. So we see a migration of the entire manufacturing process overseas. The most famous example, of course, was Bhopal, the worst chemical industrial disaster in history. Bhopal was in India. It was a U.S. company that was manufacturing toxic pesticides there in India under conditions that would never be allowed here. Um, There was a gas leak. Some people call it an accident. It was actually an inevitable. Ability. The pro- there was not an accident. I mean, the, the factory was run so sloppily that it was just waiting for this to happen. Um, there's est- different numbers of estimates on how many people died. It's hard to know because the Indian government just dumped lots of them into mass graves, so it wasn't possible to count. The death toll is now at over 20,000, and it is continuing. These are some of the Bhopal survivors. They don't call themselves victims. They're not Bhopal victims. They're Bhopal survivors, and they are fighting back and linking up with other um, survivors that have been exposed to toxic chemicals or who live near these plants all around the world. And their slogan, which is such a representation of global solidarity, is no more Bhopals. Um, There's also great resistance happening in terms of um, uh, NGOs and and people's movements and governments getting more strict about screening foreign investments. This is an excellent resource, this book called Screening Foreign Investments. The countries can say, yes, we will take your technologies, but we want your cleanest, best technologies. We want to leapfrog over that whole toxic, laden, dirty industrial development model and share the cleanest, greenest, best technologies instead of being a dumping ground for technologies that we don't want anymore. 
so that we export hazardous pesticides, we export hazardous industries. We also export enormous amounts of hazardous waste. This was an incredible example in the Marshall Islands. There was a company up in Seattle who was concerned about how much garbage there was in Seattle, and they were trying to decide what to do with all this garbage, so they had this idea to take it to the Marshall Islands and put it on the Marshall Islands to make the Marshall Islands higher so that they would be more resilient to sea level rises. And they actually said this was a win-win-win situation. Seattle gets rid of its garbage, Marshall Islands gets higher, you don't have to worry about rising sea levels. I mean, obviously that is absolutely insane. Um, the the thinking behind this is really um, embodied in this very famous l memo from Lawrence Summers, who was in 1991, he was the chief economist at the World Bank. Yes, this is right. Remember this whenever his name comes up for a new political appointment. In 1991, he wrote this memo that he said was for internal discussion only at the World Bank, but some, somebody leaked it out. In it, he argued for exporting more hazardous stuff to what he called less developed countries. He said, and this is a quote, I think the economic logic behind dumping a load of toxic waste in the lowest wage country is impeccable and we should face up to that. And he said that because of a number of reasons. One is that a person's value is based upon their earning potential, and these people earn less than we do. Second, um, a lot of the exposure to these toxic chemicals causes um, health impacts later in life, and these people aren't going to live long enough to get those diseases anyway. He actually said this, and he also said that vast areas of less developed countries are under-polluted, and so he thought that we could actually add more. <laughs> This, this mentality, even though Lauren Summers is no longer at the World Bank, and he said he meant it to be ironic, um, but in any case, that mentality really underlies our international trade in hazards. Now, Pacific Islands are somewhat protected now from imported waste because of they have a Wangani Convention that was um, signed in 1995 that limits waste imports into the region. But it's very hard to stop waste imports into the region if exporting countries are still exporting it. So we really have to work here to stop waste exports. Over the last um, couple of decades, the kind of really outrageous schemes like that dumping on the Marshall Islands have slowed down. There are less than there used to be, but there are still major streams of very high hazardous waste that are being exported. One of the biggest ones is e-waste, which is all of our cell phones, televisions, laptops, all of these electronics that we churn through. E-waste is the fastest growing and most hazardous part of our municipal waste stream. The reason it is hazardous is because all of those gadgets have a lot of toxic material, lead, cadmium, mercury, hexavalent chromium, brominated flame retardants, PVC, our, our self, they also have valuable stuff. Every cell phone has about 50 cents worth of gold in it, has copper, it has some valuable materials, but lots and lots of hazardous stuff. And so our companies want the valuable parts, but they don't want the hazardous stuff. So what would they do is they export it overseas. This shows a map of where e-waste is exported. It's certainly not only Asia and the Pacific, but you see a big concentration around Asia and the Pacific. Just to show you an example, I've snuck into these facilities all over the region, and these are some different photographs from places in the region. These flat screen TV, these flat screen monitors that nobody wants anymore because they're ugly, um, have like four to seven pounds of lead each in them. You know, lead is a potent neurotoxin, and we are sending those all overseas. Of the e-waste that is um, given for recycling in this country, about 80% of it is exported. So you see people with no protection break them open, pull out the hazardous stuff. Here you see a big pile of um, women with the wires that are coated with PVC and they're taking off all the PVC to get the copper inside. They often just light them on fire to burn the PVC off so they can get the um, copper. If you burn PVC, you create dioxin and the presence of copper increases the amount of dioxin you take. And so th this is enormously um, hazardous for the people who live around these facilities. Now, if you do recycle your e-waste, which is the right thing to do when you're done with it, Make sure you give it to a recycler that is e-stewards certified. E-stewards certified recyclers promise not to send their e-waste to other countries. That is a, a thing to, good thing to do in the immediate, but it's not a long-term solution. The long-term solution is to force these companies to make these gadgets safe and durable so we don't have to keep replacing them all the time. We want them made, to sa made it safe and made to last. So that the real leverage is how these things are designed. We want them repairable, recyclable, and we want them to last for a long time. I remember when I was little, we had one toaster the whole, my whole life. Like nowadays, it's every nine months. You know, cell phones, the average life of a cell phone in this country is 11 months. The only consumer product with a shorter lifespan is an ice cream cone. I mean, it is absolutely insane. It is insane. So we need to force these companies to make them safe and make them last. We need to resist the upgrade and stop churning through them like a fashion accessory. Mm -hmm. And we need to stop looking at other parts of the world as disposable. Our resources are not disposable. And 
and other parts of the world are not disposable. Yay. Next. Um, that one of the reasons that, that international waste trade is slowing down is because of this Basel Convention. The Basel Convention is a UN convention which restricts the export of hazardous waste from OECD to non-OECD countries. This banner we hung when the Basel Convention was signed, it said it, it, crim, it, criminalize, it now criminalizes toxic terror. Oh, no, oh, sorry. I forgot which banner picture I used. Um, this was our second banner. The first one we said was that it now legalizes toxic terror because the original Basel Convention just set up a regulatory mechanism to allow waste exports to continue. It has since been amended to have a ban so that now OECD countries are prohibited from exporting hazardous waste to non-OECD countries. There are some loopholes around the recycling issue that we're still working on. And there is one industrialized country in the world that has not ratified this convention, which is the United States. If you're interested in that, there's an excellent organization working on it. It's called the Basel Action Network because the International Convention is called the Basel Convention. It's ban, B-A-N dot org, which you can remember because we want to ban waste exports. So the latest rage in exporting hazardous um, things to Asia and the Pacific is exporting incinerators. Now, incinerators are so stupid. They are these giant machines that burn resources. Now, we have just been hearing about all these resource constraints in the world. What on earth are we doing spending hundreds of millions of dollars building giant machines designed to destroy resources? Like, it simply doesn't make sense from a sustainability and resource stewardship perspective. As well, the emissions from these things are absolutely horrible. Um, so incinerators produce enormous pollutions coming out the smokestack, enormous toxic waste that you then have to deal with. But even worse, incinerators lock your regions into continued waste production. These things are like waste addicts. They work most efficiently if they run around the clock rather than in batches. So if your region builds one of these things, your government is going to be committed to continue to produce that waste because it needs that materials, needs that stuff to burn to keep operating. So it will really upset to watch this migration of incinerator proposals into Asia, the Pacific. Enormous resistance. This is an action um, from the Philippines. The Philippines is the only country in the world with a ban on incineration. There are some loopholes in that ban, and it is being really um, uh, contested by international development agencies and corporations, so it needs a lot of support. This excellent organization, Gaia, is the Global Alliance for Incinerator Alternatives. If you're interested in more information on incinerators, that is the URL. I just happened to see the international coordinator is Gaia of Gaia is standing in the back. If you could just stand up. Gaia is based in the Philippines, but the international coordinator happens to be here today. <laughs> They are coordinating movements all around the world that are fighting these things and working for safe solutions. But so we export hazardous pesticides. We export hazardous industries. We export hazardous waste. We export um, hazardous incinerators. But do you know what is the most hazardous export of all? <laughs> that capitalism is close. That's what it is. It is our, but our most hazardous export is this toxic-laden, growth-obsessed, capitalist, racist, cost-externalizing, consumer-driven way of organizing a society. Um, now, when I talk about consumerism, I'm not speaking against consumption. Consumerism is different than consumption. We all need to consume to live, and a lot of people in Asia and the Pacific actually need to consume more to, to have a healthy life. What I'm talking about is consumerism. Consumerism is that relationship to consumption where we find our meaning. We demonstrate our social value. We demonstrate our worth. We, we turn to stuff rather than people for fulfillment and joy and meaning. That's consumerism, and that's the problem. See this cartoon? Look, honey, I bought something today. Oh, darling, I'm so proud of you. It's that, it's that <laughs> kind of culture that is the danger that, that makes consumerism <laughs> consumption not a means to live but a means of showing who we are as a result of this spread um, we are seeing a massive spread of Walmarts and massive mega consumption all over Asia and the Pacific um, Walter talked about being corralled into schools to be taught about them, um, to be indoctrinated into sort of western imperial culture we don't need to corral people anymore because we lure them in with things like this Next up, the shopping mall is the new place where we bring people in to indoctrinate them into this culture. The largest shopping malls in the world now are in China, Malaysia, and the Philippines. That is the new sort of culture, culture imperialist culture spreader. As a result of this, our consumer muscles have grown so big that it has become our primary identity where our citizen muscles have atrophied. And that is a real danger because in order to respond to these kinds of dangers, we need to work together as engaged citizens. But we are not related to and spoken to and validated as citizens. Our consumer self has developed so much. That's why you often hear the word consumer and human being interchangeably. So we really need to step out of our consumer self into our citizen self 
Last slide, the resistance, I could not put a picture of resistance here because it is everywhere. All over the world, people are rising up against this. I think that the resistance to this hazardous um, migration or exporting harm is best summed up by a sentence a Filipino friend told with me. He said, we need to change NIMBY, not in my backyard, to NOPE, not on planet Earth. We need to find a different way to live. Next. Thank you so much. You made it to the end of the show. In this conceptual, spiritual marathon what that was Moana Nui, you are only about six miles in. Still got a couple of hundred miles to go, but you've got hundreds more people running alongside you. Apex Express will have more from the conference this summer, and I'll be going to the Philippines to follow up on a lot of the themes and discussions that were brought up during the teach-in. Please follow me on apexexpress.tumblr.com. On Tuesday, June 25 at 6.30 p.m., join filmmaker Ben Wong and producer Christine Kwan for a community screening of Breathing, the Eddie Zhang story. The free screening will take place at the New Parkway Theater out in Oakland. The film is in a draft form, so audiences are encouraged to provide crucial feedback that will lead to the completion of the project. For more information, visit our website, apexexpress.org. The Oakland Asian Cultural Center invites you to meet their new executive director, director Tamiko Wong, on Wednesday, June 26 at 5.30 at the OACC. Please also come out and experience what OACC and the surrounding Chinatown community have to offer in the arts, services, and opportunities. Visit the Apex website for more information. Next Thursday, June 27 at 6 p.m., join Kearney Street Workshop in a karaoke sing-off. Loud and proud. A benefit for KSW's historical aperture. Just in time for Pride, Kearney Street Workshop invites you to a raucous and rollicking Thursday night party to get your weekend started. For more information, go to apexexpress.org. information on what we do or to subscribe to our podcast and to listen to our archives hit us up on our website apexexpress.org if you have an idea for a show or you'd like to get involved please do with our collective email us at apex at kpfa.org special thanks to jill montgomery and our intro and outro music by asian crisis thank you for listening tune in next week for another edition of apex express and stay tuned for the Bonnie Simmons Show. Thank you.